what is it about the world in the early part of the 21st century that makes, um, makes obesity and by extension type two diabetes a problem that it wasn't, uh, again, the year I was born, you know, it just was, you know, it's a literally a log fold difference in type two diabetes, a log fold. That's, mm -hmm. that's hard to imagine in, in 50 years. I think there's multiple closely related factors. Um, I think one is the food supply and its availability itself. I think the second is kind of lagged intergenerational effects. Um, just for fun, I'm going to uh, try to rebut you on the genetics point, uh, but only, only uh, pedantically. Mm. Uh, I think that we have seen genetic changes that- Epigenetic changes or genetic changes? Both. But certainly, I'm going to put more direct knowledge, my, my direct knowledge and confidence on the genetic as opposed to the epigenetic changes. Um, and this is assortative mating, differential mating. Are the, Do these fully account for the obesity epidemic? No, of course not. Am I trying to say that they are the biggest influences? No, of course not. But I do think it's important to push back and say, these are factors and they come in through migration, through differential fertility, uh, and through assortative mating. We've written papers about all these, and as have others. If you look in things like Framingham, you see that people in certain BMI ranges have more children than people in other BMI ranges. And some will say, but obese people have fertility problems. You see, we're not asking about how good you are in theory at producing offspring. We're asking how many offspring you produce. And so if richer, thinner people use more birth control and have fewer offspring, then, and there's some genes for thinness, you're going to reduce their prevalence and vice versa. So through migration, uh, differential fertility, and then the other is assortative mating, which doesn't change allele frequencies, but changes gene frequencies. So you get like mates with like. But if you had to, again, all of those things make sense. Yeah, I just wanted they, to They strike me as that. somewhat marginal though. What do you, what yeah, fraction so I, of I had the to increase? be a professor for a minute and get the pedantic <laughs> points out. Fair. Okay. All right. So now that's, that's out. I think that it is largely, but not exclusively, um, the increased availability of a greater variety of foods, of highly palatable foods, of foods that are relatively modest in cost, foods that are easy to acquire, the uh, control of ambient temperature, which makes it easier to overeat foods. You don't want to overeat a lot if there's no air conditioning and you live in Austin, Texas, and it's 110 degrees out, right? But if there's air conditioning, the buffet is okay. Uh, and then I think there are some intergenerational lagged effects that we, or at least I, don't fully understand. If you look at the Danish data, Torkel Sorensen and others have written about this. They, for over 100 years, conscripted, if that's the right word, every... 18 year old healthy male into the Danish army. Um, and they have not only heights and weights of each one naked, kind of weirdly, they have photographs of each of them naked. Um, and what you see in these, these BMI levels is you'll see a period where it's flat for a little bit, approximately, then you'll see a steep acceleration or steep increase, and then it'll flatten out again a little bit, and then you'll see a steep slope. And this happened, this has happened in your three or more cycles, I think. I don't think anybody exactly understands why. Um, Diana Thomas's mathematical model, she's a professor at uh, West Point, studies obesity. Her mathematical models predict some of that. I don't fully understand how that works, but we might ask her. Um, it does suggest to me, even culturally or behaviorally, there could be some lags whereby the weight of your parents or grandparents is affecting you. Socially or, or genetically? Both, right? So the oocyte that formed you was formed in your grandmother. Mm -hmm. So potentially through epigenetic things you've mentioned mm -hmm. or others, that could be affecting you. Then there's the cultural part. You know, and I, I think about it, when I was a kid and we went out to dinner with my dad and we weren't poor, but we weren't rich, we were decidedly you know, middle class, lower middle class creeping up. Um, if we went out 
and we wanted to order at the local Italian restaurant or something, order shrimp. You had to ask dad about that. And chicken parm, you could order without asking. Shrimp, you had to ask. Shrimp was expensive. You can get shrimp by the bucket now at the local buffet for next to nothing. So I'm prepared to eat a lot more shrimp than my dad ever would have thought of ordering or sitting down because of our changing economic times and so on. Now, my kids think nothing about ordering dinner in from DoorDash every night, where I still think even though I could afford to do it as well as my kids could because they're spending my money some of the time, which is great. I'm glad they're doing it. Um, but I think, oh, that just seems excessive to me. You know, it seems too indulgent. So I think there may be sort of levels at which one ratchets culturally as well as physiologically or anatomically. So I think all of these things can be in play. I also think we need to change some of the attitudes. And this is speculative on my part. I have no proof that this is true. But I think one of the bad things that the nutrition field has done, including um, very much the public health community, which talks about the, I used earlier, I said the healthy foods that have magical effects. But I also think the the, the low carb advocates and zealots who came up through the late 90s and still exist at present and have very powerful voices, and yet others still. I think there's the sense that there's a right way to eat. Nobody agrees on what the right way is, but there is an underlying supposition that there is a right way to eat. And if you just ate that right way, then you would maintain the weight you want to maintain and the fat level you want to maintain without ever feeling lack of satiety or dissatisfaction or what have you. You and I were talking about our personal diets. Yeah, but th what's interesting about that is that's actually philosophically not that different from a drug approach. In other words, if you constructed a, a lot of parallel universes, it's certainly possible that if you put everybody on a perfectly adherent version of diet X, Y, and Z on each of those parallel planets, you would eradicate obesity. And by the way, one of those planets, you might say, well, we're also going to put everybody on terzepatide. Mm -hmm. And so, so you now have multiple different dietary treatments when perfectly adhered to that will dramatically improve obesity. One of those will be just a drug. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe two of them will be a drug. Another one will be a gastric bypass, et cetera. It still doesn't answer the question, what triggered the problem, right? It still doesn't answer the question. And, and again, I don't, I don't know that we want to spend too much more time on that because these are unanswerable questions, but it's a, it, you know, though, what is the right diet to fix it doesn't mean that the absence of that diet is what caused it. I because agree. even The, the most point part, I was trying to make yeah. is that by saying to people, there is a right way to eat. We may foster a delusion. That is, the real debate perhaps is not between the low carb guy and the the non low carb guy as to what this thing is, or the low eat locally, or you know wh yep. whatever. The real debate may be: Is there a right way to eat, compositionally or behaviorally, time of day or something that will satisfy you? not make you feel deprived in the real world we live in, not in a parallel universe we could construct? Um, and the answer may be no. And yet by continuing to sell that idea, we may continue to have people searching in the wrong spot. Instead of searching for how do I control or overcome my incomplete satisfaction with eating only this amount, and instead they're looking for What's the way to eat that I don't have that dissatisfaction? And I think what we probably, what we may have to accept at some point is that for most of us, there, there are exceptions, but for most of us to maintain a truly thin or lean body composition, if that's what we want, and I'm not saying everybody should want it, but for those who do want it, um, that we may have to accept that either we're going to have to alter our desires in part through pharmaceuticals, or we're going to have to accept that we don't get to meet all our desires at times, as opposed to continue the, what may be the charade, that there is a way that you can just eat a certain kind of food or certain type of diet or eat in a certain way that will lead you 
not to ever feel dissatisfied. So I think that's an important sort of stoic yeah. approach, right? With a little more stoicism. Thank you.